SJC 11790, Commonwealth v. Douglas Dos Santos. Good morning. May it please the court, Alexandra Deal for Mr. DeSantos. The statute before you creates an untenable situation whereby the scarlet letter of abuser is automatically branded on a defendant upon the mere say-so of the Commonwealth without any showing of probable cause or any opportunity at any point in the entire proceedings for the defendant to ever rebut the allegation. The constitutional infirmity of the statute becomes even more striking in the case of defendants who are charged with crimes where abuse is not an element, malicious destruction of property, for example. In that case, if the Commonwealth alleges, pursuant to general law, Chapter 276, Section 56A, that abuse occurred either immediately prior to or during the offense, the result is that a permanent record is made of a separate uncharged offense for which there may or may not have ever been adequate proof and which will never be vetted by the judicial process. Can I just uh, ask you, it, it seems to me it may be a distinction without a difference, but the, but the language that describes what the district attorney is supposed to do is somewhat different than the finding the judge needs to make. I mean, one says, I forget, but the judges is in connection with, right? That's right. And the, and the, and the, the district attorney is in conjunction with or immediately prior to. So is, is there, does anything get made out of that slight difference or is it basically <clears throat> one and the same? Should, should we interpret it as one and the same? Well, I think it's one and the same because <clears throat> for two reasons. One is that Actually, the, if you look at um, the, the Commonwealth included in its um, supplemental record, the blank form, that's at supplemental record six, um, if the Commonwealth alleges abuse occurred immediately prior to or in conjunction with the crime, then the judge must find, um, having inquired whether it occurred immediately prior to or in conjunction with the crime, that abuse is alleged in connection with the charged offense. So I don't think that there is a distinction. The shorter made. way of saying I, the same thing. Exactly. I mean, the judge, I, I don't think the judge has any discretion in this situation to really make any determination as to what the nature of the alleged abuse is. Now, the, the, the record appendix contains a form where what you just represented uh, was, uh, was entered, with the information entered on it. Is, is the form retained in the criminal case file in, in the trial court? Is, is it impounded? Is it forwarded to the commissioner of probation where it stays forever? I think, Your Honor, it's the latter. To be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm not sure what happens to the form itself. It's not considered in the case. I know that the finding itself um, cannot be considered in connection with the charged offense. But that doesn't mean it can't be considered in connection with a whole host of other things, and that's where the statute becomes particularly problematic. Um, because it's not just the finding itself, it's the finding that can serve as a basis for denying someone a gun license pursuant to Chapter 140, <coughs> Section 131. Well, does How the does person have work? an opportunity? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you. No. you go. How does that work when the uh, the language says, uh, I think it says uh, conviction. I mean, I've been looking through this trying to figure out, well, where does this show up after the judge makes the finding? And I can't figure that out to get to your, your due process problem. Where does this where does this finding, finding show up? Show up. Well, the yes. finding gets entered in the statewide domestic violence Register record keeping system, right? And then that record keeping system is considered, or may be considered, in other proceedings. So, for example, um, General Law Chapter One Forty, Section One Thirty One, and I believe it's subsection E, um, says that the licensing authority may consult the statewide domestic violence record keeping system um, in order to make its determination whether the person applying for either a license, a new license, or the renewal of a license can in fact have the license. So it doesn't mandate that the registry or that the record keeping system be considered, but it does allow for that. Well, all of the statutes that you, you cited in your, uh, in your brief, 
use the language criminal record involving violent crimes or abuse. So are you saying that this notation of a finding is synonymous with criminal record involving violent <clears throat> crimes or abuse? Well, I think that's where it becomes a little problematic because it does also say, all of these statutes do say that the statewide domestic violence record keeping system shall be consulted to see whether the person has a record of violence or abuse. And I think well, this, that- Well, this isn't a criminal record though. It's, it's, it, it's, it's just not. It's not a criminal record, but in a way, it is actually a permanent record of an uncharged criminal offense because there's no real difference between an allegation of abuse under 209A Section 1 and really a charge of domestic abuse under 265 Section 13M. They both are an assault and battery on a household member, assault or an assault and battery on a household member. So basically, in each instance in which the Commonwealth is alleging abuse in connection with the charge offense, really what it's saying is domestic abuse, but it's never held to a burden of proof, any burden of proof. But, but uh, when, for instance, the chief of police or, or whoever the licensing authority is considers this information for the purpose of issuing a gun license, um, they're, they're going to consult the domestic registry but they're not going to rely on that information. It's going to, what that's going to do is create a paper trail where the chief will then go and, and, and look at the criminal docket that, that the domestic registry is referring to. Isn't, isn't that what it all means? Well, I think it means that they may rely on that to consider whether, in fact, somebody is an abuser. And I think that that's where the problem is, and, and that's where it comes but, into play when you're talking about no contact orders with your children, when you're talking about um, forcing someone to leave the marital home. It's because you're looking at a record that's been made that says this person has engaged in <clears throat> domestic abuse. And I, I think that that's what these that's what this statute allows the Commonwealth to say without ever having to present any proof on that fact. And it also then allows the licensing authority, it allows courts, it allows um, the police to consider that record, which essentially says the defendant has committed this crime of abuse. It, does, it doesn't say that. It says the offense alleges that abuse was involved. It, it, it doesn't say that. That's true. It does say that it's alleges that abuse is involved, but that even that mere allegation hasn't been put to any sort of standard of proof. Well, if, if someone were denied a license <clears throat> because of this information in the registry, don't they have a right to a hearing where they can offer evidence that that's either true or not true? I don't know the answer to that. I imagine they probably would. Um, but I think that the problem starts out, and I, I think a good place to look um, is this court's opinion in Doe versus Attorney General, which considered um, the constitutionality of the sex offender registry as it related to level one sex offenders. Um, and, and what the court said is that a combination of circumstances persuaded it the defendant had a protected liberty and privacy interest, um, at least under Article 12. And, and that was, first of all, the mere requirement of the registry, and here you have the requirement of the entry of a finding, um, to the disclosure of the information on request. And here you don't have a public disclosure the way that you have um, in the case of sex offenders. Um, but you do have disclosure to law enforcement, to judges, and then also to a licensing authority and um, the DCF. Uh, three, the possible harm to a defendant's earning capacity. So that's a perceived harm. It's not necessarily a real harm. It's a possible harm, and that is what you have here, a possible harm uh, to the defendant's interests. Four, uh, harm to the defendant's reputation, and you certainly have that here. How, how do you have that? It's, it's, it's inaccessible except by law enforcement and courts. I think you still have a reputation. I mean, in the eyes of the state, it's said that you are alleged to have been an abuser. So, so any time a, a criminal complaint issues, um, a, a person's reputation is, 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 we have to do something about it because a, a, a person's reputation has been adversely impacted. I would submit that's a little different, Your Honor, because at least in the context of a criminal complaint, there has been some showing of probable cause. Well, well there has here, too. Unless until it's dismissed. There has here, at least in the sense that 
the, the, um, this, this uh, statement by the prosecutor, verified by the judge, um, refers to a criminal complaint. It does, but it doesn't have to be a criminal complaint for abuse. So it could be, for example, a criminal complaint for malicious destruction of property. Well, so or the, larceny, I suppose. Well, exactly, anything. And, any, and that doesn't affect a person's reputation? It, that affects a person's reputation, but that's a quali so there's probable cause for issuing the complaint itself initially. And then throughout the process, and even on the core, you'll see reflected the disposition of that offense, so it's qualified in some manner. The issuance of this statement, this written finding, is never qualified. There, so if a person is convicted, say a person is guilty of malicious destruction of property, um, and the person is convicted of that crime, well, that goes on the quarry, but this, this finding, this written finding of abuse also stays on that person's record then, even if abuse isn't an element of the charged offense, if abuse doesn't come into play at trial, if abuse is never mentioned again, if the Commonwealth at arraignment makes this statement that it alleges that abuse has occurred prior to, immediately prior to malicious destruction of property, then that remains on this person's record in the statewide domestic violence record keeping system forever. Um, what, what, what do you what think? If, what if? What if we said that the statute as proposed seems to give a judge a role where the judge, according to you, all the judge is doing is simply saying, yes, there's a preliminary statement that's been filed, and the, 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 the role is purely ministerial. What if we said that the judge's role is to examine what the allegations are, I guess in the police report, since apparently the preliminary statement doesn't contain any detailed allegations, and do what the judge would do essentially for a motion to dismiss. That is to say, uh, the statements, the allegations, if proven, would constitute abuse. And there a judge would have a role, because then the judge would be examining what the allegations actually were, and would be determining, not, a, not with regard to credibility, it would be Essentially, I have looked at the allegations in the police report, and if those allegations are indeed proven, they would constitute abuse as defined by statute. What if we did that? Would that solve your problem? I think that would go towards solving the problem because it would give the judge at least some discretion to examine the veracity of the statement, um, the underlying basis for the statement. The, the problem is that even a well-meaning prosecutor could be incorrect in his or her allegation that abuse had occurred. Um, and, and without at least allowing the judge to evaluate. So the judge says, OK, show me. Prosecutor files a statement, and the judge says, what, is that in the report somewhere? Let me, let me take a look at the police report. I mean, isn't that exactly what Justice Gantz is saying? So it's not just taking someone's word for it, it's actually looking at the uh, allegations, presumably in a police report or a civilian complaint. Yeah, that, I think that goes part of the way, but the second part is that I think that the judge has to be able to have the ability to say, I acknowledge that the Commonwealth has alleged abuse, however, I don't find that under these circumstances. But does that mean you think there should be an evidentiary hearing? I think that there should at least be some <clears throat> showing, some burden of proof put on the Commonwealth, whether it's a preponderance or whether it's probable cause. Do they have to but, call witnesses? I mean, is it like a probation violation hearing? That you're, what would you? What What do you think? Assuming the Commonwealth has a that there is a a public interest in having some uh, reflection of allegations of abuse in the statewide domestic violence registry. What, what do you think the process should be? Well, I suppose that the Commonwealth would have to recite the facts as alleged um, so that the judge could hear what those facts were as alleged. Um, and if there were, in fact, a police report, which presumably there would be under the circumstances, then the judge should have an opportunity to at least review the, the report and determine that, yes, I think that this allegation of abuse can stand, and I will enter this written finding. And, and, and can stand, I mean, your concern before was that there may be probable cause for the underlying crime, but not for probable, not probable cause of the abuse. Would you be saying that the judge would essentially be saying, 
based on the police report, I think there is now probable cause for an, a, a, an allegation of abuse? I think it's a difficult finding, or a difficult question, because when you're considering, for example, 209As, <clears throat> pardon me, which also get entered into the statewide domestic violence record keeping system, that's not a probable cause standard. That's basically a preponderance of the evidence standard. It's that the affiant has shown that he or she is in danger, um, and that the judge has has taken that allegation as it is. But, um, but if so, there was if there was a complaint of domestic abuse for a crime of domestic abuse, probable cause would be sufficient. That's right, and well, in that well, case, the why, finding. Why should it be higher when it's not a domestic abuse crime, but another crime for which abuse is is alleged? I think it's particularly problematic when it's another crime because then on its face it becomes much more difficult to tell what the allegation of abuse actually is. So when the Commonwealth can simply come in and say, yes, Your Honor, we the Commonwealth allege that abuse has occurred, that becomes very problematic not only for due process reasons but also, as I see, we probably won't get to separation of powers issues because the Commonwealth is basically dictating what the judge will find. Do, do, do you also say that, the, that, the, that either the trial judge or the plea judge um, has to revisit this whole question to ensure that, that this background information of, of domestic abuse um, uh, entered into either the trial or the plea? Uh, and if it doesn't, then something has to be done. Well, I don't know that the judge, that particular judge, has to be able to revisit it so much that it would be helpful if, for example, in the way a 209A can be vacated, there is some mechanism somewhere along the line for the defendant to challenge the entry of this particular finding. Because, again, if a 209A is on somebody's record, that's qualified in the sense that it may say vacated, for example. There's nothing about this finding well, that is ever qualified. When you say finding, it, 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 it's a ruling no, that the, the statute says finding. The, 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 the statute says ruling, doesn't it? Um, written ruling. I'd have to check, but the, the form itself says form allegation says of finding. domestic abuse and written finding. Yeah, but, and it but, says, but the statute says ruling uh, that an allegation has been made. That's right. Um, and, and also the form itself says a finding that an allegation has been made. But the statute made, doesn't say finding. I would have to review the language okay. of the statute, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Melissa Johnson. I'm an assistant district attorney in Middlesex County. Here with me at council table is the trial prosecutor, Laura Montes. So is it your view that a judge can't say, no, I'm not going to enter that ruling? Do you, haven't, you haven't demonstrated that. Well, I think that actually there is a little bit more flexibility than my sister would have this court to believe. And I'd like to try to put this court in the position of the district court judge who this is before. You have to understand that according to the statute, this is done at the bail hearing. It's done at arraignment. Mm -hmm. And according to the bail statutes, before the, the district court judge or, or the trial judge releases this defendant on bail or on conditions, um, that, that's where this is happening. So all of these underlying facts are before the judge. By uh, statute, he has to or he, she has to consider the underlying nature of the offense. She, he or she has to consider whether there's a history of domestic abuse. He or she has the com criminal complaint why, before do, why does that help about what stays in the permanent record, though? Well, it, it's all of this information is being fleshed out at the very same time that this written ruling or this written statement uh, is being considered to be entered into this system. So, so the defendant says, hey, judge, none of that is true. I want an evidentiary hearing. Uh, is, is he entitled to an evidentiary hearing? I don't believe so for some of the reasons that were discussed previously with my sister that the fact that, well, to what end? I mean, what is really going on here? Is there some kind of denial of a substantive right like there would be with an indictment trial, what have you? All we're trying to do here is make sure that these, that the record keeping system here is accurate. Oh, it has but, a whole lot more implications than that. You have to be se oh, serious. No, Your Honor, but at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here, what the legislature is doing here is a recognition, 
It's a recognition that these district court judges every single day are making life and death decisions based only on a court activity record information sheet. They don't have the full picture of what is going on here. And that court, that carry sheet, if you will, will has everything in it. It's got everything from, from uh, dismissals, convictions, you know everything is in there, yet it's not giving them enough information to make the decision that they need to do for protection of the victim. But um, I didn't really hear the answer to the question of whether or not the judge could depart from what the uh, district attorney is saying. I mean, you know, you're saying all this information is before uh, the judge, presumably in connection with the bail determination. Yes. Um, and if the judge does not discern the domestic violence aspect of this to be substantial or really really enough to make that kind of ruling uh, that uh, the allegation has, has somehow been made. Um, the judge does or does not have the discretion to uh, forego making that ruling. Well, Your Honor, I believe that there's absolutely nothing that, the, that is before the judge during this hearing that there's any kind of, and the judge has to inquire of the Commonwealth uh, where's the domestic abuse conjunction connection? What's going on? Yeah, here? and doesn't really. And think there's it's... nothing, and the Commonwealth is still pushing the statement. Because so this believe... is really domestic violence, and the judge is saying it seems to me like it's just something else. The larceny. It's a larceny. Well, the larceny still could have a domestic abuse. Yes, but the though. judge doesn't really sort of see it uh, in the way that the DA is saying it's there. But if the if the Commonwealth is making an allegation. Um, that there's some kind of connection and the judge is hearing the facts of it. And says, I don't see it. Well, according to this particular finding here, I mean the, uh, the, uh, the um, form that is in the back of my supplemental record appendix, <laughs> there are rooms here for further, there is room for further findings of the court. So I suppose if there was absolutely nothing in any of the allegations that were before the court, there would be room uh, for them to say simply, I, I, there's nothing here. But what about in the, in the case of the malicious destruction charge? Mm -hmm. uh, the, and the prosecutor says uh, there, there are allegations of domestic abuse, and, and, and here's what they are, ta -da, ta -da, ta -da. come along trial. There's no evidence whatsoever of domestic abuse. He gets convicted of malicious destruction, and now there's a record somewhere that can't be removed that, uh, that there were allegations of domestic abuse. What do you say about that? Well, I think that's a, a very good question. And what I would say is, again, looking at what what the, what the purpose of what's going on here. It is for accurate record keeping. I don't think that there's any reason why, and this court does have an inherent, or this court, the trial court has an inherent um, power to correct its own records. It could, there's no reason why a supplemental one of these uh, ruling, the, these forms couldn't be filled out because if you see it says here, states that there is no evidence or insufficient evidence available for the Commonwealth to presently allege. I mean, it could go both ways. I mean, you could have a situation where there is a, a fight in a bar and the uh, officer arrests the two parties not realizing that there is, they have a child together. Uh, in common, and this, there is actually a domestic element here. He doesn't realize that until further on in the investigation post arraignment. I mean, I think that there could be some mechanism here, given that this is just purely ministerial and record keeping, to correct that record. Uh, and in the reverse, what if, the, uh, what if um, there's an arrest in this same situation, the officer believes that these two people have a child together in common and there's some domestic element? It turns out that they don't. They don't even know each other. There's nothing in the statute that provides for that, There's right? nothing in the statute that provides for that, but there's no reason under the court's inherent um, power, given, that, given this form and what it says, uh, and given that this is simply for the purposes of accurate record keeping, um, for another form to be filed so that a subsequent judge who's looking at a bail hearing can look into that domestic violence record keeping and see, okay, there was this form and then there is this subsequent form that's you know, saying something else. I, I have to apologize, but I, I just, I don't understand how this statute works. So the Commonwealth makes a preliminary written statement. I mean, what role does the judge have? because the next line is shall make a ruling, and then the preliminary writ 
written statement of the Commonwealth is the thing that gets sent to the domestic. What, what, what is the role of this finding that the judge makes? Well, it's just basically, I, what I can understand it as far as this legislation, I think this kind of goes to Justice Spina's question. What happens to this form? Is because the form isn't what we're talking about here. The written state, the statute says the written statement of the Commonwealth it's shall be sent to. It's this particular form from what I understand that was well, constructed. It's not, this isn't a statement of the Commonwealth. Well, there is a, the front portion, the top portion of it says the Commonwealth pursuant to 56A of chapter 276 submits this preliminary statement. So I'm assuming that it's this particular okay. paper. The thing is it's done in, it's done at the same time as the but this bail is hearing. This, this is the statement. This is the statement. And I believe that it's done in conjunction with the bail hearing and what the legislature was concerned about. And as we had talked about priors, the, the DV record system and the statute in particular wants to maintain the confidentiality of this, wants to make sure it's not in the clerk's file, the same time that the bail hearing is going on. So this particular piece of paper is going directly to the probation department. It's All right. not- So if this piece of paper, I'm looking at it, the mm -hmm. assistant district attorney signs the top part that says simply, Commonwealth alleges abuse, right? Yes. Uh, and then the bottom part is what the judge, I guess, fills out. Um, so could the judge just, in his further findings, say, I don't, uh, I don't find that there is sufficient evidence of abuse and, and a story? And that would be his but findings. And where does this go? And then the probate, uh, someone in the probation office would then take that piece of paper, make sure it doesn't go to the clerk's file, and type it into the domestic violence, violence record keeping system. And what would it look like? Commonwealth alle alleges abuse, judge concludes there's insufficient showing of abuse. Is that what the... Essentially, I believe, or perhaps they could scan the document itself. Wait, so you're it saying... doesn't matter what the judge does with this? It's going anyway? Well, it's interesting because also in the, the uh, legislation also amended the 58A statute where the written findings of the judge for or against release also have to be entered into the domestic violence record keeping system. So I'm assuming that they are just typed into that system. And the point of the whole thing is to give that subsequent judge, the judge at the subsequent hearing, as much information as they can, because remember that they only have that, that carry sheet before it. If they see a string of assault and batteries, all of which have been dismissed, how do they interpret that? And that's why the domestic violence uh, record keeping system was created over 20 years ago to supplement the district court or the trial courts. I, I don't think anyone is disputing that this can be a valuable tool. We're just mm -hmm. really questioning how it works such that the rights of the parties are properly observed, even in this circumstance. I agree with you. And this is obviously brand new legislation. And this is how the trial court, this form was created by the trial court. And I think a lot of it was trying to balance and ensure that the confidentiality provisions of both the domestic violence record keeping system and the statute itself um, were honored um, at the same time with inf as much information given to that s subsequent district court judge as possible. I believe that's the purpose of this. Okay, so let me, let me see if I understand your position. <clears throat> Let's imagine you have a larceny case, okay? The issue is the, the, the ex-boyfriend goes back and takes property that he claims to be his. The girlfriend says, no, it's mine. Goes to the police, says he stole it. It's larceny. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a result of that, a, an ADA puts out the form and says that is an allegation of abuse. Judge hears that allegation and says, no, that fact, even if proven, would not meet the definition of abuse. Uh, are you saying that this allegation of domestic abuse form still gets filed, even though the judge has found that the allegations, even if true would not constitute abuse? I believe that the form as it, whatever is on the form is submitted to probation. Um, so, so, the judge is, so the judge, what's then, why then, then did the legislature give the judge a role if the judge's role is wholly inconsequential? Your Honor. Why didn't it just say that the Commonwealth should file a preliminary written statement and go straight on that she'll be maintained within the domestic violence record keeping system. Why give a role to a judge at all? 
No, I, I do understand what you're saying here, but the fact is is that this domestic violence record keeping system is to maintained by the judiciary, and there is an interest in keeping it, whatever's in there, as accurate as possible. So, But that wouldn't my, be accurate. And I, that's what I'm saying is that it could be amended at some point. There's no reason why information could not could be but if amended. if the judge makes that judgment in Chief Justice Gantz's example at, at the bail hearing, there never was a, all there was was an allegation that the judge rejected from the get-go. So why would it ever be accurate? Your Honor, I, the, the whole purpose of this particular system is simply to assist future um, judges in trying to determine what's going on here. If, if the judge didn't find that there was abuse and that judge made that call, um, then they d determined that the information wouldn't be pertinent to a future judge at a future hearing. So, so, so if, uh, if, if, for instance, um, uh, 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 there was a subsequent event, mm -hmm. another case, a year down the road, mm -hmm. uh, I take it that the, that the judge a year down the road, a different judge, could consult the, the domestic violence registry and, and determine or find <coughs> that um, uh, that there was an that a prior allegation of domestic abuse had been made, yes. and that and on, on this earlier occasion the judge said no, there was no domestic abuse. But it still may the fact that that actually happened in court may still be relevant because if you think about what happened in Vicaro, there are situations where situations such as that where it still might be meaningful in some respects. In Vicaro, we did have an, an a emergency restraining order, which was late, lo, later vacated on the merits. And yet this court said, you know, there may be situations where that information but, taken but, in a certain context could be meaningful. And it's important just to give the whole picture how can it of be what meaning, How can it be meaningful if the judge determined that the facts as alleged would not constitute abuse? That's abuse by the prosecutor. The prosecutor abusively made an allegation of abuse without any factual support. And the judge is supposed to say, let it go, and then say that's supposed to be viewed as a meaningful and fair reflection on the defendant. It's a reflection of abuse by the prosecutor. And the, but that could be fleshed out at the bail hearing that is currently going on. I mean, that's why that this is going on at the same okay, time. Okay, and so the, the judge says, basically, you've alleged abuse. It was an, it, this is an improper allegation. There's no basis for it. But you're saying that this form still has to go to probation? And, there, and it still has to reflect that there indeed was an allegation of abuse? And a year later, when this person comes before the court again, they're going to say this defendant had, had a previous allegation of abuse? I do still think that there is flexibility here for the judge to write in because of this but form. What if comes up on the registry yeah. when the judge checks? Is it this form or just the, the, the notation Fact. that there's been a prior allegation of abuse? I believe uh, whatever, if there's anything written on this form, that would go into the record. Um, just like when now when we have 58 hearings and there are written findings by the judge, that has to go into the record. But if you're looking record. at a probation, you mean... If I look at a probation record now, and somebody had a 58A hearing um, a year ago, when I actually look at the computer screen, it's going to have the whole text of what was found? No. Your Honor, the way that the statute is currently written in terms of 58A is that the written findings of the judge, whether they are for release or for against, must be entered into the system. Um, but this doesn't say, this just says that the that the written statement, which I believe is this entire form. Well, the form centered. is created by the trial court, right? So we don't have yes. to have that form. I'm sorry? We don't have to have that form. The form is optional. The form is what was created by the trial court but, in response to the legislation. But it's not the, the, the form itself is not mandated by the statute. No, no. This was created in the response. The that the form is the problem, the form can be uh, disposed of. Absolutely. If, the, if this court has an issue with the form or has suggestions about the form, certainly that could be made. This form was just created by the trial court in response to the legislation to try to effectuate um, all of the confidentiality provisions, making sure that this would not end up in the clerk's file, yet at the same time uh, give the information um, into the probation file, into the domestic violence record keeping system. 
Do you think uh, in a 16L letter or something and consulting with your uh, sister, you might be able to, to explain to us what actually appears on the domestic violence record system? It, in other words, a finding or a ruling is made. What, what a year later will appear on the computer screen? I could whatever. absolutely try to find out that information <coughs> for you, Your Honor. And Do you know whether the Attorney General has been notified that there's been an attack on the constitutionality of the statute? Uh, I don't know if there's been any formal notification other than uh, the fact that this has now uh, been scheduled for argument. There's, there's no one from our office, that, as far as I know, that has notified them. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.